We hope that you enjoy this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com. Lord, it's been good to be here already, and so in the next few minutes, we ask that you would change us, make us better than when we came out, when we first came in, so that when we leave this place, Lord, that we are, we are in tune with you. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, one day, a 92-year-old man wasn't feeling so good. So he checked in with the doctor, and he went in, and he asked for all the tests to be run and a checkup. About a week later, the doctor saw him walking down the street with a beautiful young lady. And he seemed just as happy as he could be, and the doctor was a bit surprised. He said, wow, you're sure doing a lot better. And he said, doc, I just took your orders. You said, find a hot mama and stay cheerful. The doctor said, I did not say that. I said, you have a heart murmur. Be careful. (laughs) How many agree you got to listen carefully, right? Today, I want to talk to you about worry. How many of you would say you worry? I see we're going to lie our way through the sermon today. That's fine. (laughs) You may not have raised your hand, but admitting you worry is kind of a tough thing, isn't it? It's like your first AA meeting or something. You know, how my name is Lee, and I struggle with worry, anxiety, and stress. (laughs) The McCourtney Institute at Penn State University recently surveyed people for 2022. They found that Americans are experiencing high levels of stress, worry, and anxiety. In fact, 84% of Americans say they are extremely worried. Is that an incredible number? 26% of Americans actually said that nothing gives them hope anymore. And more than 50% of Americans are extremely worried about our country. You know what that tells me? All of us have worries. Turn to the person next to you and ask them right now. You're worried about something, aren't you? Go ahead and ask them real quick. You're worried about something, aren't you? (laughs) See, what did I tell you? We all got worries. Now there's a lot of free advice out there about worries. People will say, oh, don't worry. Everything will turn out good. How many have had somebody say that to you? Is that true? No. No, the car doesn't start. (laughs) The house has a flood in the basement. Things don't always turn out good. Things can go wrong, right? Or have you heard this one? Don't worry. Yeah, the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. How how many have ever wanted to just tell the radio, shut up when that song comes on sometimes, you know? Or some people say, don't worry, just don't think about it. Oh, okay, so just be a zombie, right? The problem is that doesn't really work. Jesus knew worry would be a problem for us. And he knew enough that he, here's my section on Matthew 6 about worry. I, it's one of my favorite passages too. It was my father-in-law's as well. In his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he spent some time talking on worry. If you want to turn your Bible to Matthew 6, 25, And this scripture is up on the screen and also in your outline. These are the words of Jesus. So let's read them out loud together. Would you please read it with me nice and loud? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Let's read that again twice as loud. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. You go, wait a minute. That sounds like don't worry, be happy. Excuse me, Jesus. That's not any help at all. But here's the big difference. If God asks you to do something, he also gives you the power to do it. If you study through the various Hebrew names of God in the Old Testament, you'll find that God has a name for most of the needs of our lives. And when it comes to worry, God has a name, El Shaddai. How many have heard that Hebrew name of God before? When it comes to worry, God says, why in the world would you worry when I can handle absolutely everything for you. The first place this name of God is found is in Genesis chapter 17, the first book of the Bible, in verse 1 and 2, where it says this. It says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Now, if you have an NIV Bible, there's a pretty good chance that right after God Almighty, there might be a little asterisk or an A 
And if you drop down, a lot of Bibles will say under A, El Shaddai. Isn't that interesting? And then it gives you the translation. You might want to fill in this blank in your outline. The all-sufficient, almighty God. So if God is the all-sufficient, almighty God, then worry is ridiculous. How many agree worry is ridiculous? God can handle anything. Six of you, awesome. The rest of us got a little ways to go. Why is worrying a crazy thing to do? Well, first one, reason number one, life is not about all my stuff. Mm -hmm. Say amen to that one. Amen. If you read the rest of verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Jesus says, don't worry about your stuff. Have you noticed we worry about stuff? Mm-hmm. We worry about where we're going to live, or we're going to buy, or we're going to rent. Either way, it's expensive. Inflation's making our money not go as far now. And if you get the house, what do you have to do then? You have to fix it up. You have to remodel it. You have to change it. You have to hang the pictures. You have to move the furniture around. Oh, that furniture doesn't work anymore. Got to get rid of that furniture. Get some different shirt. It's like we've got to chip and Joanna Gaines our house now. <laughs> it's very easy to worry about all that kind of stuff. We can worry about our job. Is anybody ever worried about their job? Mm -hmm. Is anybody worried about rent going up? Amen. Anybody worry about hailstorms in Colorado Springs? Amen. I got a bunch of, I'm such a Colorado Springs guy, I went and got a bunch of thick blankets and I put them in the back of the car so if the hail starts, I'm going to run out there and put them on the hood, put them on the top of the car like, ha, won't get any dents, maybe. Does that work? You think that'll work? No. No? I'm going to have to carry plywood around. Just let it, just roll with it, right? If we buy a car, what do we worry about? Whether it'll be reliable, will it depreciate, will it get good gas mileage? If it's a Tesla, will the battery run out before I get to where I'm going? There's even, you know, Tesla de uh, owners have to worry too. They're always worried about the battery. There's even stuff to worry about in beautiful Colorado Springs. Will the Broncos win the Super Bowl? Please, Lord. And let them beat the Raiders both times in a season. How many say amen? Yes, amen. All you Raider fans need to get saved. All right, so let's keep going. <laughs> Jesus says, life is not about your stuff. As I like to say, you never see a hearse with a U-Haul on the back of it. You can't take it with you. So there's no use in worrying about all our stuff. And we shouldn't worry, number two, because I am very important to God. Reading on verse 26, Jesus says, look at the birds in the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And see, why do you worry about your clothes? See the lilies of the field, how they grow? They don't labor or spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Jesus says, look at the birds. Now, I have a problem with that particular stretch of scripture. We used to have a parrot and a love bird in our house. Mm. <laughs> Not a good time. The parrot could raise someone from the dead with its call. How many have been around a parrot? They are loud. They're like 110 decibels. <laughs> I'm like, wow, aren't you happy this morning? Parrots are not happy. They're mad. At least the one we had. His name was Arthur. He is mad all the time. He's had a long life of mad. Do you know parrots live longer than their human owners many times? That's a curse from hell for me. I'm sorry. Thank God my daughter took those two parrots back. Oh, it was a horrible time. So when Jesus says, look at the birds, I'm like, okay, birds maybe, not parrots, not, not them. But birds do know how to live one day at a time. Everything they pick up, they eat that day. They use it that day. Not us humans. We have pantries. We have garages. We can't even fit our cars in our garages. Why? Because we have all our stuff in our garage. <laughs> Jesus is saying, you can't have shelves. Your garage isn't... <laughs> I said that wrong. Jesus is not saying that you can't have shelves. If your garage is overflowing, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But, I mean, Jesus is saying, watch the birds. They don't have anything stored up and they don't worry. Our pantry is full, and we do worry. A third reason. Are you having fun in church today yet? Yeah. Reason number three, worry never helps anything. Verse 27, 
Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? <laughs> that is a great question by Jesus, right? In fact, just the opposite is true. When we worry and become anxious, our nervous system releases stress hormones. These stress hormones are called cortisol. These hormones boost the fat in your blood that the body uses for fuel. So that's actually a good thing. Your body gets some extra fuel, and that's where we get the term nervous energy. In an ideal scenario, those extra hormones will fuel our bodies in a good way. The problem is we don't jump up and get real active. We're so worried we sit around worrying. So then four things can happen. One, our immune system crashes and we get sick. Two, we develop muscle tension so we get in pain. Oh, my back, oh, my shoulders, oh, my knees, you know, and all that gets to hurting. Or number three, we become forgetful. We experience memory loss. We stop thinking clearly. We call it a fog. How many just learned something? You're like, that's what's wrong. It's the cortisol. <laughs> Got the brain fog. Fourth, super serious, we develop heart disease. We put ourselves at risk for a heart attack. So this is where we get the term worried sick. Researchers, listen to this. Researchers now estimate that 75 to 90% of all visits to primary care physicians are for complaints that are stress-related. We're going to a medical doctor because we're stressed out. Every week, 112 million people in the U.S. take some form of medication for stress-related symptoms. You say, so why did you give us all this information, Pastor Lee? I told you all that so I could tell you Jesus is right on. Worry can't add a single hour to your life. I have never heard somebody come up and go, you know what, I worried about it all night and this morning everything got better. Worry just really fixes the problem. Have you ever heard anybody say that? <laughs> no, actually what we say is, why did I lose sleep over that worrying about it? That's what we say. Worry can actually take years off your lifespan. But there's a fourth reason I shouldn't worry. God never misses any details. Going on to verse 30, it says, If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? I had to use the King James Version. I love that, O ye of little faith. <laughs> Jesus said, you don't need to worry because God never misses any details of your life. Isn't that amazing? God knows how many hairs you have on your head, and he actually numbered them. You say, really? Now, in some cases, that's not a big number for some of you, <laughs> you guys, but he has them all numbered. He knows, his way, he knows when you lose one. That's amazing. You say, oh, he does not know all that about me. Yes, he does. God is something called omniscient. That means he knows everything about everything. He never misses a detail. I heard about this man. He was driving home late one afternoon, and he was driving above the speed limit. Sure enough, here's a cop sitting out on the side of the road. He turns off after him. He lights up his flashy lights. The guy's like, I don't know, maybe I can outrun him. So he guns it. I don't recommend this, by the way. So he guns it. Cars are going faster and faster. The car goes 60. The cop matches him. The car goes 70. The cop matches him. He goes 80. The cop stays right on him. Finally, the guy's like, I, I, what am I doing? I got to pull over. This is nuts, you know? So he pulls over. The cop walks up to his window, got his hand on his revolver. He says, uh, let me tell you something, buddy. I could actually arrest you right now. But I've had a really lousy day, and I want to go home. So if you will give me just one good reason I should let you go, I might do it. The man thought for a second, and then he leaned out the window, and he said, well, officer... Three weeks ago, my wife ran off with a police officer. And when I saw your cruiser in my rearview mirror, honestly, I was worried you were trying to make me take her back. So is there any way you would let me off? And the cop laughed and he goes, hey, have a nice evening. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't worry. God can work it out. How many agree? Give the Lord a hand. God can work it out. God says, I know all the details of your life and I'll help. And on the back of your outline, one last reason not to worry is 
I will look like I'm not a Christian. Jesus is talking to verse 31 still. He says, so don't worry saying, what will we, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or, or what will we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. See, when you're worrying, us Christians are acting like we're not Christians. We're acting like we don't believe in God. We're, it's called practical atheism. Now you might say, uh, Pastor Lee, I believe in God, but I still worry. I understand, me too. But you just have to realize that that's such a bad witness to people when we're worry warts, and they are too. They're going, well, your God doesn't help with that. And usually what's happening is we start to think things depend on us. And that's a slippery slope into a bad place where we start to take matters into our own hands. How many have ever taken things into your own hands, right? And we think we got to figure it all out. The Bible is saying, relax and trust God. Turn to the one next to you and say, relax and trust God. Go ahead and tell them, relax and trust God. Christians are not to worry because it's a bad example to the world. And then there's the worst kind of worry. Here's the one that's really bad. People say, you know what? Things have been going so good lately. I know something's going to go wrong any minute. How many have ever said that? <laughs> I just know there's something around the corner that's going to be devastating. <laughs> That's terrible. You know what you're saying. You're saying, I know God blesses me, but you know, every once in a while, he just pulls the rug out from underneath me, and then I fall flat on my face. Oh, that's terrible. The more things are going good, do we start thinking God's got a bummer for us right around the corner? You never have to worry about that. God is not mad at you. God does not bless you just so he can mess you. God is more full of grace and love and mercy than you could ever imagine. The last thing you have to worry about is God being unfair or God trying to toy with you and hurt you. Reminds me about the blonde. This blonde decides she was going to uh, paint a couple of rooms in her house. So her husband left for work, and so she gets down to the task at hand. And, I mean, a whole day later at 5.30, her husband comes home. He smells the distinctive smell of paint in the house. He walks into the living room. He finds his wife laying on the floor and is a pool of sweat. He notices she's wearing a ski jacket and a down parka on top of the ski jacket. He goes, honey, are you okay? She goes, yeah, I was painting a room in the house. He says, all right, but why are you wearing the ski jacket and the down parka on top of that? And she goes, well, the directions on the paint can sub for best results, put on two coats. <laughs> Sandy likes that one especially. <laughs> Love you, baby. <laughs> and her mom's a blonde, too. It's like the, the whole family's mad at me now. All right, so how do I stop worrying? Number one, fill this in. Put, I, I wore my happy shirt. I'm trying to cheer you up in case you're worrying. Is it working or is it not working? Is it working? Doing a little better? Okay. Put God first in every area of my life. Yep. Verse 33. Famous verse. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and what happens then? All of these other things will be given to you as well. <laughs> there is an answer to life. Well, I got to do this, and I got to do that. We're going to pay that. We got to sell that. We're going to buy that. We got to oh, if we don't do that, that's there's not going to be another one available. If we don't, yeah. if we don't get them, we got to meet with the teacher. We got to meet with the preacher. And God goes, focus on me. I'll fix all that. So powerful. When we start worrying, it's a warning light, blinking red light going off. Priorities out of order. You haven't spent any time praying with me. You haven't spent any time in my word. And yet you're going, what am I going to do? Just do that part. And God goes in, watch me work and rearrange it for you. So the starting point is to have a relationship with him. The Bible says that you're born with sin. Isn't that crazy? The moment you're born, you've got generational sin in your spirit and in your body. You're sinful the minute you come out. That's why babies get into trouble. That's why younger kids get into trouble. It's because we have a sinful nature. There's nothing we can do about it. 
We're going to live in a sin-cursed world. And then God said, I want to redeem the world. I love the world. I love the people. I love all of humanity. So he sent his son to pay the price for our sinful nature and our sins. And if you accept what Jesus did on the cross for you, the Bible says you become a believer and your old life is over and you get a new life. A new life begins. And then God says, if you'll just spend time with me, I'll do all that stuff you can't figure out. I heard about this uh, young sailor. He was training in the Navy. My daughter-in-law's sister was in the Navy just recently and got out and reminded me of her. So this young sailor, he's in the Navy, he's being trained, and he was given the opportunity finally after a lot of training, many months, to show off what he learned. The captain said, you can take the ship and get it underway. Oh, he was so excited. So he goes up in the helm of the ship and with a stream of commands. He has the docks buzzing with men. and Soon the ship was steaming away from the dock out to the sea. Oh, he established a new record for getting a Navy destroyer underway. Well, he was not surprised when a seaman walked up to him and he said, I have a message for you from the captain. Oh, he was a little bit surprised, though, that it was a telegraph that was being read to him, and he was even more surprised to hear what was in the telegraph. It says, from the captain, my personal congratulations upon completing your underway preparation exercise according to the book and with amazing speed. In your haste, however, you overlooked one of the unwritten rules. Make sure the captain is aboard before you depart the dock. <laughs> That's good advice for us, isn't it? Make sure the captain of your life is on board before you make a decision. His name is God. Put God first. Second step, we're almost done. Live my life one day at a time. How many think that's good advice? Pick it up in verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says, don't put your umbrella up when it ain't raining. Don't start worrying before you get there. Is anybody famous for that, like me? Still lying, okay. Every week, <laughs> every week there are two days you should never worry about. Yesterday and tomorrow. Concentrate on today. And the third thing, trust God to handle what I can't control. First Peter 5, 7. We're skipping over to the a little bit later in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Peter. 1 Peter 5, 7. Let him have all your worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Jesus is in charge of running the universe, not you. <laughs> Some of you need to resign as the manager of the universe. How many of you are sitting next to a manager of the universe? Anybody? Don't raise your hand. Just, you know, just glance at each other real quick. We just don't realize how incredibly powerful our God is. How do you do that? Number four, don't panic. Have a little talk with Jesus. How many remember that old hymn? Just have a little talk with Jesus makes it right. That's your alternative. Either panic or talk to Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. everything. If it isn't worth praying about, it isn't worth worrying about. One day at a time. Trust God for things beyond my control. Number five, learn and recall God's promises. Philippians 4, 6 says, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I had a good friend named Stuart Fall. He did something so interesting. I went to lunch with him while I worked at Honeywell. We're sitting in his car, and it said a red light, and he flipped his visor down. And I saw an index card that had a Bible verse on it. I said, uh, what are you doing? He goes, oh, during red lights, I try to memorize scripture. He said, sorry, I shouldn't do that while you're in the car. And I said, no, it's okay. And he said, no, I'll do it later. I said, wait a minute, so tell me again what you're doing. He said, when there's a red light, I flip down my visor, I have a, a card on the scripture I'm trying to memorize, and so I read it again at every red light. 
And I said, what if the light turns green and you're still reading the card? He goes, oh, they honk. <laughs> How many would be one of the people who honks? <laughs> Let's go. What's going on up there? <laughs> he never worried about the red light. He was memorizing Bible verses. My friend, Stuart Fall, he now lives in Michigan, he memorized 500 Bible verses that way. Recall the promises of God. So many good promises. I read about a lady that was complaining about everything that went wrong with her day one day. She said, God, why did you let so many bad things happen to me? My alarm didn't go off, so I was late to work. At lunch, I went to the deli to get a sandwich, and they made the sandwich wrong. I had to send it back. Driving home, my cell phone dropped a call right in the middle of a conversation. Nothing went right today. So God said to the lady, uh, let me just go down the list. Your alarm didn't go off because there was a drunk driver on the road, and I delayed you on purpose so you wouldn't be harmed. Oh, and you had to send the sandwich back because the first person wasn't feeling well that made it, and I didn't want you to get sick. And I didn't want you to catch what they had. Oh, and the call that was dropped on your way home, yeah, that person wanted to fill you in on a bunch of gossip, and I didn't want you contaminated, so I cut the call off. Could it be that what's frustrating you is actually the hand of God positioning things in your day? You say, oh, it went so bad today. And God goes, I protected you from so many things. I was taking care of you all day. He's protecting you. He's guiding you. He's positioning you. And that might require that you catch a cold, that your sandwich is bad, that your car is bad news, whatever it is. That's when we have to trust him, that he has you in the palm of his hand. How many are glad for that? <laughs> Amen. And here's the result. Philippians 4, 7. And I like the Living Bible version of this. It says, if you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your heart quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Amen. Mm. <clears throat> True confession. I worry too much. Do you? So if you worry a lot, you are my people. <laughs> I wrote this sermon last night. I finished it, I think, at 1030. And I had the worst night and woke up with a panic attack and had a nightmare. So the sermons for me, I hope you enjoyed listening while I talked to myself. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask Sandy, I'm a worrier. Sandy is my anchor. A lot of times I say something and she'll go, what? Why are you worried about that for? Sandy has this remarkable ability to go, what? No, no. But even better, Jesus has the ability to do that. 1 Peter 1, 5, 7. I didn't get it into your outline. It came as a late-breaking verse last night. It's one of the coolest verses in the Bible, but it's on the screen. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In the month of June, I came and preached and said I wanted to be your pastor. And the way I did that was I told you about my failure. Anybody remember? Yeah. And during that sermon, we studied Peter, how the Lord redeemed him, and he had a comeback. Remember that? And Peter and the disciples had been fishing all night. 
and they didn't catch anything. And then Jesus is standing on the shore and he yells out, friends, do you have any fish? And what they answer back? No. Yeah, they were ticked. No. And then in John 21, verse 6, here's the scripture that was part of that story. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. That's what Jesus told them. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Now, do you remember that verse we just read? Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. And now Jesus told the disciples, cast your net. It's the same word. He says, cast your anxiety on him. So let's do that. Let's do that with our arms. Would you stand up for a second? I know this is a little weird, but let's do it. Would you humor me for a second? Because I need to do this. With your arms, from my left to your right, take both your arms. And right now, we're going to take all the what? Get both your hands out there. We're going to cast this sucker. We're going to take all the worries, all the anxiety. Are you ready to go? Pastor Sean, catch a video of this. This is going to be an epic moment. I want you to just pan the congregation. We're casting our anxiety. We're casting our fear. Are you ready? You got them all there? All your worries. All your anxiety. All your fear. One, two, three. Whew. Oh, that was good, but it was a little weak. You look like you, I think you got a third of them. Let's go for all of it. How many want to cast all your anxiety on him? Start over here again on this side with me now. Are you ready to go? One, two, three. Cast them all on Jesus because he cares for you. He cares for you. That's showing spiritual trust with the physical action. Just keep casting it. This week, when you start to get up tight, you start to worry. You have a panic attack at 3 a.m. You can't get something out of your head. That's when you need to go, Jesus, I cast my anxiety. Do it with me one more time. I want you to get used to cast my anxiety on you because you care for me. You don't have to carry it with you. Jesus cares about you. How many are glad about that? Peter says, just like that, I got rid of it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, mm, I worry. Ugh. I try to solve it. I try to fix it. I think maybe I messed something up. I forget you're at the control. Jesus, help me realize you love me. You care about me. I'm valuable to you. You want to meet my needs. So help me, Lord, all through the week. Just keep grabbing that anxiety, that stress, that fear, and casting it on you. Because you will take care of it. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, I hope you'll take that step right now, just in the quiet of this moment. You could have a conversation with God. It could be just silently from your heart. Jesus knows everything you're thinking, all your thoughts, what you're saying in your mind. You can say something like this. You can just say, Jesus, I don't know if I understand everything about this, but I know one thing. I like what I've heard. So as much as I know how, I'm in. I'm, I want you to forgive me. Please forgive me for my sins. Would you come into my life? I, I want to be a new person. I want that new life Jesus talked about. Let the old life go to the side. I want a new life where you're part of it. So you can make changes in me. I'll spend the rest of my life learning more about it. And Father, we thank you for your word, the Bible, in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com.